talk about the edge. What would you consider to be the biggest design challenges when it comes to edge computing applications? Low power? Of course. Robust security? Most certainly. But what about longevity? When it comes to IIoT, automotive, or consumer edge processing applications, we're looking at anywhere between 5 and 15 years of running in the field without the need for costly updates. If you had a solution that could give you the longevity you need, the ability to control your power and performance, and optimize your SOC, you'd jump right on it, right? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about today. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Robust security, insured product longevity, and low power consumption are critical design considerations for edge computing applications. In this episode of Chalk Talk, I sit down with Srikanth Jagannathan from NXP and discuss the benefits that the i.mx93 application processor family from NXP can bring to your next edge computing application. We investigate the details of the EdgeLock Secure Enclave, the EnergyFlex architecture, and ARM Cortex-A55 core, and how they can help you launch your next edge computing design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. Hi, Sri. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. So, Shri, we're exploring the i.mx93 applications processor family today. But before we get started, can you set the stage for us? We're looking at solutions for edge computing, right? That's correct, Amelia. As like number of edge devices are growing every day, every year, the amount of processing required for the edge is also increasing. So initially, maybe like 10 years, 15 years back, the edge devices had very little processing capabilities. So it was almost like kind of a data collection where it would get data from the sensors and then send it to the cloud or some server to do the processing, but not anymore. In the recent times, you can see the edge devices needs a lot of processing capabilities. You don't want to send the data to the server or cloud, but be able to perform computations and processing at the edge and take a decision. So that's where the edge computing is gaining more and more prominence. That makes sense. Now, a critical aspect of these designs is lifespans of the components, right? That's exactly correct. There are different segments that have edge computing. For example, the main segments here are consumer IoT, could be smart homes, smart city kind of uh, applications. Then there are industrial edge computing industrial IoT, so where there are a lot of these different applications such as like scanners, printers, gateways, etc. And then the third major one is the automotive IoT segment. So if you look at the industrial and the automotive segments, the main criteria is longevity. So what that means is typically the customers take a long time to get these processors into production. So it might take anywhere between, say, five years or even up to 20 years to get all the devices in their factory or, say, in their automotive chain to get updated to the current processors. So being able to supply 10, 15 years of these processors, like no, is one of the main criteria for going into these segments. So from NXP, we offer something called NXP Product Longevity Program. So wherein we look at the product, we look at what segment it caters to, and depending on the segment, we have either a 10-year or 15-year longevity commitment. So for this IDOTMX 93, for example, it's part of a 15-year longevity program where we guarantee supply availability of IDOTMX 93 for at least 15 years starting when it goes into production. So for example, we are going to production by end of this year. So that's our plan. So 2023, we'll be launching the product in production, and we are guaranteeing supply at least until 2039, which is 15 years from 2023. Excellent. Now, Shri, we've covered other i.mx families here on Chalk Talk in the past. 
But where does the i.mx93 fit into the overall ecosystem? Yeah, so the i.mx is our brand, right? From NXP, we have had i.mx series for the past like 15, 20 years, starting from i.mx1 all the way. The last product that we released was i.mx 8M Plus, which was about two years back. As you all know, like a lot of different segments, a lot of customers, a lot of applications are using the i.mx processes. So NXP, at NXP, we are very, very excited for our next generation of i.mx application processes series, which is i.mx 9. So in that i.mx 9 series, the i.mx 93 is the first application processor family that we are going into production or that we are launching. And that's going to happen this year. Great. Now, can we explore some of the benefits of the i.mx 93 family? Sure. As always, like every product has differentiated features that we like, you know, that the customers are looking for. So as we started this discussion on edge computing, the main features that the customers are currently looking for uh, in edge computing is apart from the high processing and um, low power, the other main things are high security. Because now as I started off this discussion, the amount of computing that we're doing at the edge is getting higher and higher. And we don't want some untoward activities like hacking and things happening on the edge devices, and that can cause vulnerability all the way to a server or a cloud. So we want to be able to protect the data that the application processes are basically working on. So security is a key element. And apart from security, the other uh, main thing is also being able to perform machine learning acceleration and being able to perform uh, machine learning applications is something that's gaining importance from the customers. So for all of these features, we have you know, the Dynamics 93 being able to cater to these parameters that the customers have demand on. So for example, from the security point of view, we have the edge lock secure enclave, which basically is the NXP solution to uh, address security. So this is a very highly complicated block. I don't want to scare customers away. When I say highly complicated, it's for NXP. We take up all the complexity. We basically implement on all the security functions and uh, like, you know, complex functions, but make it simple enough for customers to utilize it. So we have uh, very basic security functions such as secured boot or secured debug. But also apart from that, we have like, you know, more uh, intense functions such as being able to create cryptographic keys, doing trust provisioning, et cetera. So all of this is included as part of the edge lock secure enclave. The second thing here is, as I mentioned, typically when we scale uh, technologies, when you look for products in the new generations, customers typically look for higher performance, but at a lower power. These two phenomena, right, the performance and power are counteracting because typically when you go at higher performance, your power also increases. But at NXP, we take power very, very seriously because we want to be able to save power, not just for customers, but for even in terms for like, you no know, want to make sure we are green and like, you no know, being able to reduce the overall power consumption everywhere. From architecture level and also from the design level, we take large amount of care to reduce the overall power. So that's where this energy flex architecture comes into picture, where basically we break down our SOC into multiple domains and be uh, able to provide, say, a clock or a power supply to these domains individually. And then apart from that, uh, the IDRMX 93 also has scalable computing, wherein like we have uh, Cortex A55 cores as our main application core. So we offer a single core, dual core version. So basically customers can go either use a single core, A55, or say if they need more performance, they could go to a dual core and uh, the SOCs are perfectly pin to pin compatible. So they are easily able to move from one core to two core without changing any board design. And then a few other things, like, you know, apart from the application core, we also have a built-in MCU, the Cortex M33. So this allows customers to uh, being able to go into a low power mode. So for example, customers might not need a lot of performance all the time. So they can switch off the Cortex A55 completely and then move their application to the M33 core, which is much more power efficient. And also the M33 is also typically used in uh, segments such as automotive or industrial where it requires a lot of real-time processing. One other exciting thing we have added to the IDMX 93 is the dedicated neural processing unit to run machine learning applications. We have integrated the ARM Ethos U65 
which is a very high efficient NPU or neural processing unit. And we are seeing great results from silicon. And then apart from that, uh, apart from all these features, we have also providing a lot of interfaces that are specific to certain segments for making the Aerodynamics 93 as versatile as possible and being more like, you know, a general purpose uh, application processor that can fit into a lot of different segments. So, Shri, you mentioned that this family uses the Cortex A55 core. So why did you guys move to the A55 and what does it buy me as an engineer versus the A53? Right. So our previous generation of IDMX process, which was IDMX ATEM plus ATEM Mini ATEM Nano, which we uh, launched in the past, like, you know, four or five years, all of them are using Cortex A53 as the main application core. But the Cortex A55, which is the next generation, provides a much better performance as well as coming at a lower power. So this fits exactly into what I discussed in terms of going green and also being able to provide customers with higher performance. So Shri, I'm really interested in the edge lock secure enclave. Can you talk more about this aspect of the i.mx93? Definitely. So this is one of the interesting and the exciting uh, features that we have added to the i.mx93 93 and also to the other products in the ninth family. The edge lock secure enclave is going to provide the security that is required for these application processes. There are a few common things to do, like, you know, for example, secure boot. We want the boot process to be secured. You don't want anything untoward happening during the boot process. So that's secure boot. And the other thing is secure debug. Again, when you know, you're debugging what's really happening on the system, you don't want any attacks or anything that happens in that time to cause any untoward performance or any untoward results on the SOC. Those are basic things. But then the more advanced things such as key management or like, you know, providing a route of trust or like, you know, doing some kind of a runtime attestment, those are more advanced things and that require very dedicated, secure engine inside the SOC that can provide that. And so this edge lock secure enclave is capable of doing all that. And then in terms of the implementation, it is a separate island. So that's why it's called an enclave. It's an island and it sits by itself. It safeguards the entire SOC. It looks for any untoward tampering thing happening on the supply or tampering happening on the individual clocks coming in to the SOC. So it basically safeguards the entire SOC against anything from external world that can cause the SOC to gain access in a way that we don't want any external people or agents to have access to. And then on top of that, we also provide something called trust provisioning, wherein you basically have only a trusted source being able to access and uh, use the SOC. Okay, so Shri, you also mentioned the Energy Flex architecture as well. Can you give me some more details about that? Definitely. So the Energy Flex architecture, the main intention is to save power. So what we have done is uh, we have used the IDMX 93 SOC and then we have divided that SOC into multiple domains. So the way we form a domain is like, you know, we use a certain subsystem or IPs that go around it that does a basic functionality and we call it a domain. So for example, the application domain contains the Cortex A55 course along with the cache memory. And it's called application domain is because that's where the main application is going to run at. And then we have a low power domain. The Adobe X93 has the, apart from the A55, it also has the Cortex M33 to do low power application. No wonder, like, you know, we're calling the M33 and it's tightly coupled memories and other interfaces that are directly attached to it. It's part of the low power domain. And then we have other uh, subsystems, like, you know, for example, the NPU, the neural processing unit, along with its memory, it will be part of one flex domain. Then there could be other flex domains, say, for example, we have, say, a camera subsystem, we have display subsystem, all of this could be separate flex domains. Once we basically break the SOC into domains, what we do is each domain has its own clock and also its own supply voltage. So as you know, like clock is the most important thing going into a block, like, you know, that keeps everything synchronous and it basically gives you the required output or performance, right? So clock also takes up a lot of power. Like, you know, when you have, say, a clock running at, say, a maximum speed compared to half the speed, you're going to save so much power. And also the other thing is the voltage, right? The supply voltage is directly related to the power consumed on the chip. So being able to provide separate clock and separate supply voltage 
is very, very useful for customers because now the customers can go and optimize, say, clock frequency for what performance they need from that block as well as supply voltage based on what performance or power they need. So basically, this gives a lot of tuning knobs to customers where they can go and optimize the entire SOC by changing clock and supply voltages for the different domains and being able to perform their application within their performance specification and also within their power budget. Okay, so what about the built-in MCU? What kind of advantages does this bring to the table? So application process, like, you know, I think when we first started, it was all using the Cortex-A course because that's the one that runs applications, say, on Linux or Android. But then as we moved on, as we were, like, you know, getting matured, we thought, like, you know, there are a lot of scenarios where customers don't want to use the A core because it consumes a lot of power, right? So there are, like, no lot of scenarios where, like, a sensor doesn't do anything for 99% of the time. And then 1% of the time, it just collects the data, processes the collected data, then sends out an output. Say that's a use case. For this 99% of the time, you don't want to use the A-Core because like, you know, you don't need any performance. It's doing very low performance work at that time. And then just that 1% of the time where it's actually working or processing the data, that's when you need high compute or high performance. So in that scenario, if say we didn't use any M-Cores, if we had used the A55 cores, we would be wasting a lot of power because the Cortex A cores are very, very good in terms of performance, but then it actually also increases power consumption. So what we have done is for such a use case, we add this Cortex M33, which is a MCU, compared to a A55, which is a smaller processing unit. So it adds processing, but then it comes at a very reduced power because the performance is not as high as the Cortex A cores. So it provides lower performance coming at lower power. So the customers, they can know basically at what time they need performance. So they basically can have Cortex-A cores, A55 cores running the application. And then at times where they don't need the performance, but they need to conserve power, they can stop or they can turn off the Cortex-A55 completely because of our energy flex architecture. And then they can use the M33 as the performance processing core now. This way they can greatly reduce the overall power consumption of the entire SOC. That's one of the main functionalities of the MCU. The second thing is these MCUs are more suitable for real-time applications such as industrial or automotive applications where the latency is very critical. The MCUs basically have better real-time performance compared to the A55 or the A cores. So that's the additional advantage or benefit that we bring by using the MCU or integrating the MCU in the application processor. So basically, we can target a lot of these, uh, say, motor control or gateway application and those kind of things that require the MCU or the chip to perform real-time application. Just to summarize, the main reasons for the MCU is it enables customer to go after low-power use cases, which is critical. And the second thing is also to enable customers to go after real-time applications in industrial and automotive segments. So those are the main benefits of integrating the MCU. Okay, so Sri, can we also dive into the features of the i.mx93 as well? There are more than one package to choose from, right? That's exactly correct. So we provide customers different options when it comes to packages because like, you know, I mean, there are things that the package bring in, like in terms of bigger the package, the more pins you get, the more features you get, but then it also adds the cost. We have three different package options for the i.mx93. So we have the 11 by 11 millimeter at 0.5 millimeter pitch package and also a 14 by 14.65 millimeter pitch package. The main difference between these two packages are the pitch size, 0.5 versus 0.65 millimeter. But everything else is the same. Like, you know, the pin placement is exactly the same. The overall pinouts or the interfaces that are pinned out are exactly the same. So there's no difference. So that would be our full featured package or packages. And that is the one that is given in this middle column here, calling it 933 or 935. And then the third package that we have is a 9 by 9.5 millimeter pitch package. So being it a smaller package compared to 11 by 11 with the same pitch size of 0.5, the number of pinouts is lower for the smaller package. And hence, you don't have a lot of interfaces as we have at the 11 by 11. 
So Shri, what about the smaller size package of the i.mx93? Can you talk about that a bit as well? As I already mentioned, the smaller package basically like you know has less number of pinouts. The main differences would be it does not have the MIPI CSI or the MIPI DSI or the LVDS. It supports only the parallel camera interface and the parallel display interface. And then also it has a single USB and a single Ethernet compared to two instances of both of them on the bigger packages. The main reason here is like, you know, we are looking at the different segments and we are looking at the different needs of the segment, like, you know, in terms of the interfaces, what are required. And we were able to find out that there are segments that need a lower cost solution coming at a reduced feature set. And that's where the 9x9 is going to fit in compared to the 11x11. Since the package is smaller, the package cost is lower and we're able to provide the Adidamex 9T3 with the 9 9 package at a lower price compared to the 11 by 11 package. The Adidamex 93 is a perfect fit for any entry-level IoT application because it has all the necessary interfaces, necessary processing, processing unit, and also coming at a lower price, basically because like these entry-level IoT applications are very cost-sensitive. So we are able to cater to those. And then with the Dynamix 93 having both the Cortex-A55 core and the MCU in form of M33, we're able to cater to industrial applications that require real-time processing and also to automotive applications. Again, like, you know, those might require real-time processing or might require a low-power board. The other main thing is, as I mentioned, the ARM Ethos U65 dedicated NPU gives us a great opportunity to go after entry-level vision application. Uh, when I say vision, it, the vision, it could be across, say, industrial vision, or it could be like, you know, smart home, smart city, like where you need camera input, say, for example, a smart doorbell or a smart uh, lock, or even a automotive vision, for example, the driver monitoring system. Driver monitoring system is where the camera is looking for the driver to make sure he's completely attentive, he's looking at the road in front of him and like, you know, not dosing off or not being relaxed in terms of looking somewhere else. So basically constantly looking at the driver and processing the image of the driver and then being able to notify the driver uh, if something goes offhand. So that's again a, another application of vision system in automotive. So having the vision subsystem on the Dynamics 93 enables the product to be positioned for vision applications across these multiple segments. So Shri, I would imagine that the vision aspect of this new family would make it a good fit for a lot of different applications. What particular applications have you seen it being a good fit for? This is something that we're really excited about as well. Because vision application, we're seeing it like, you know, we're seeing it constantly increasing. And then we are you're finding like a lot of different market segments are looking into this vision feature in their application. So, for example, on the industrial side, we have an industrial machine vision where basically you can have, a say, for example, an application where you have a camera looking for a defect in a factory situation. So say, for example, there is a conveyor belt which the manufactured goods are coming through and then the camera is focused on the conveyor belt and it's looking at these processed goods coming in and then it looks for any defect and then being able to find the defect and notify the user there that, okay, this product is defective and remove it, right? So that's one kind of uh, industrial machine vision. And then on the other side, on the automotive side, a driver monitoring system, as I already mentioned, is looking for the driver's attentiveness, making sure he's attentive, he's not um, looking at something else when he's driving or he's not dosing off. So all those things like, you know, and then also being able to basically notify the driver or uh, waking him up if he's trying to dose off, those kind of things are very critical and it's part of, say, automotive vision. And then in uh, smart home, you've seen tons of these products now in the market, right? Like, you know, starting from, say, these smart hubs, like smart doorbell, basically these smart, appliances or smart devices are part of everything in the household. So all of this forms the different applications, the vision applications in the different segment. And where the Adidamex 93 is going to play in is the entry level, where you require certain amount of processing within certain amount of time, but it comes under like, you know, certain cost or price budget. So for example, the best application that I can see for the Adidamex 93 is this DMS, the driver monitoring system in automotive application, because it needs a single camera. And Adamex 93 can support only one camera. So it's a perfect fit in that application. And then on the other side, say a smart doorbell, 
So doorbell needs only one camera and then it doesn't need a lot of like, you know, processing because it's predefined. And uh, so basically that's another application that fits perfectly for that MX-93. And as I said, mentioned on the industrial setting, uh, industrial machine vision, again, like, you know, that's a good fit as well as say a scanner or a printer in the industrial application. That's also a great fit for these uh, the MX-93 family. So industrial automation and building control are definitely hot topics these days. I would imagine that there would be a lot of applications in this space for the i.mx93 as well. That's exactly correct. There are a few things that we've added specifically to be able to cater to this uh, industrial market. We have two gigabit Ethernet ports on the i.mx93 SOC. So this is something that has become very critical. Like, you know, you want to have at least two Ethernet ports to be able to cater to this market. So we have covered there. And also we are able to provide the CAN ports that are needed for this segment. And apart from that, there are a few nuances that uh, you would need to consider. Like, you know, for example, the display. Typically, when you think of a display, you might think of a BPDSI as one of the interfaces that uh, the customers are going to use. But then when you look at the industrial segment, a lot of customers are using LVDS compared to uh, BPDSI. And what we have done is we have added both LVDS and BPDSI interfaces to the SOC so that IDRBX 93 is more versatile and we are able to target more segments and more applications. And apart from that, like, you know, other things that are required for the industrial applications are a lot of low speed interfaces like uh, SPI, UARTs, I2Cs, et cetera, which is what we have in this product as well as being able to have IE processing in terms of like, you know, uh, application core and as well as the real-time core. So both of which are covered. Those are the main things. And then apart from this, enabling this time-sensitive network, TSN, that is gaining a lot of popularity and a lot of customers are looking to uh, implement that in their application. So that is something that we are offering on the Dynamics 93, as well as there are specific operating system such as the QNX or VXWorks or Green Hills, apart from the Linux, right? These are the other operating systems that industrial customers are interested or using currently. We support that as well on the IDNMX 93. So this is what has enabled IDNMX 93 to go after the different segments in industrial automation. So for example, the industrial HMI, that's human machine interface that uses the display basically and at the industrial setting, It'll be a LVDS uh, interface connecting to a monitor, external monitor. So that's covered. And then industrial gateway, basically, like, you know, that requires multiple Ethernet ports. Again, that's covered. So those are like some of the things that uh, IDNMX 93 will definitely play into. On the other side, on the building control, it's very similar to the industrial automation, but it has its own different specific features like that are required. So for example, EV charging. That's gaining a lot of traction now, like you know, with the amount of electric vehicles that we are seeing on the road and on also being manufactured by the different car manufacturers. The requirement for the EV charging stations have been like, you know, constantly increasing. And these could be that are public use uh, EV charging stations, or these could be like, you know, that are set up at private homes as well. And again, Adderbex 93 is a great fit for like being able to uh, use as application processor in the EV charging board. And then apart from that, like, you know, you have the access control, energy meter. Those are like, you know, perfect use cases where it requires A55 or the application core, as well as the MCU, which is, we have the M33. So basically having that heterogeneous architecture is able to enable the Adderbex 93 as a very good fit for these applications as well. Excellent. Now, does NXP have an evaluation kit for the i.mx93? Absolutely. We've always like, you know, created reference board designs. We call it EVK, evaluation kit for our products. And uh, i.mx93 also has its own evaluation kit. So uh, the way we build the evaluation kit, uh, like at least for the 11 by 11 package, we have a modular approach where we have a base board that covers all the different connectivities, like interfaces, connectors, et cetera. And then on top of it, we have a compute module or a SOM board that has the IDNMX 93 chip along with the DDR and the EMMC and the power management circuit. So this is basically how we implement it. The other components from NXP that are supporting the IDNMX 93 application process are the PMIC, which is the power management circuit and it's part of the compute module. So we have our NXP the part number is PCA9451A, 
This is available. It's in production today. And this is specifically co-designed, I would say, along with Idermix 93. We have done extensive testing, validation of the PMIC along with the Idermix 93 processor. And also the third component that we have from NXP is the Wi-Fi module, which is the IW612 module. So all these three ICs are co-developed around the same time frame and also tested. And also our software package today for Idermix 93 automatically includes the drivers and the settings that are needed for the PMIC PCA 9451A and the Wi-Fi module IW612. This is very critical. Like, you know, this makes our customers' life very easy because they don't need to now, like, look for a new PMIC or a new for a Wi-Fi because these, apart from the application processor, the PMIC and the Wi-Fi are some of the things that goes absolutely with the application processor. So we are able to provide ease of development, ease of design for the customers by automatically linking PMIC and the Wi-Fi to the application processor. So, Shri, can you talk a bit about the different power modes here? I wanted to showcase the power modes also here, mainly because the EVK, while having the connectivities and other things enabling customers to uh, achieve their application. The other thing that we have integrated in our EVK is the power measurement capability. So the customers can uh, actually use our EVK and automatically measure power from the different power supplies going into the SOC, going to the Idermix 93 from the PMIC. Excellent. Now, Shri, in the development of this new processor family, NXP has teamed up with a lot of different partners, right? That's exactly correct, Amelia. We have engaged with our SOM partners at the very early stage of uh, Idermix 93 timeline milestones. Typically, we don't really wait until production or even close to that to enable partners. We basically enable, start enabling them as soon as we have uh, some early uh, software version ready to go outside. We have about 20 partners for this Adelmex 93, and all of them have launched their SOM boards based on Adelmex 93 within the last uh, one or two months. They were mainly doing it during the embedded world that happened this year. That was very exciting for us to see. I was there in that event uh, and we were seeing a lot of these partners launching their boards on based on Adermix 93 and getting a lot of good traction and feedback from their customers. So that is a very good thing for us from NXP to see as well. Please check out the partners. They have offer like customized boards specific for a particular application, a particular use case. Our evaluation kits are more uh, like a reference design, but our EBS partners offer solutions for applications and more uh, fine-tuned and uh, customized. Please have a look at them and please let me know if you have any um, questions reaching out or anything regarding the partners as well. Excellent. Well, Shri, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Sure. Thank you so much, Amelia, for this uh, fun talking with you and interacting with you. And uh, thanks for having me here. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.